a good number of attendees, I think. Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Melissa Fratkin. I'm the Industry Programs Director at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. I'm also the co-chair of the Texas Women in HPC organization. We're a chapter of the International Women in HPC organization. Uh, and this is our third year hosting a discussion workshop roundtable at the Rice Oil and Gas HPC conference. Uh, so this year we wanted to talk about uh, the impacts and opportunities uh, of coming out of all the horrible and, and, and scary things that happened uh, in 2020. So um, we will go through a, a quick overview of kind of why are we here um, the why are we doing this women in HPC thing uh, at the oil and gas conference? Um, why is that important? Uh, why is diversity important? Uh, things that happened in 2020 that we want to talk about. Uh, and then I will introduce our illustrious panel and we'll talk about all of the things that, that happened in 2020 and how we can move forward uh, together. So Texas Women in HPC, uh, our, our concept was to bring together a diverse community of professionals uh, in industry, in academia, in government, uh, from the advanced computing community across the state. And that includes, we include artificial intelligence, machine learning, HPC, all of the different areas of computing that are impacting um, uh, businesses across Texas and academia, obviously. Um, our mission is to provide a venue for knowledge sharing, networking, support, and visibility for women and minorities by engaging in initiatives to raise awareness and broaden diversity in HPC. Um, and, and why are we here? Because women in HPC are only about 17% of our community. We did have about 15% of uh, uh, attendees who identified as female uh, at SC20, but of course it was a much smaller supercomputing, so we had a smaller number overall. Um, still 15% of a smaller number is, is pretty good. Uh, however, SINED at SC20 increased their female minority leadership roles up uh, to 42%, which is actually much higher than the industry standard in um, networking. So we're very proud of them. And of course, there's been a diversity committee uh, at SC 17, 18, and 20. And I found uh, there's actually a, a paper written on female participation in HPC conferences. If you're interested, um, who's on the, it, it talks about who's on the program committee, who submits papers, who authors on papers, things like that. It's, a, it's an interesting study. Um, women in oil and gas, uh, this is another place, this is another reason why we're here at presenting at the oil and gas conference. Uh, when compared to 18 other industries, oil and gas is there in the bottom left. Um, when compared to things in STEM industries, it ranked last. So we have our work cut out for us uh, in oil and gas, and that's, again, why we're here. However, Houston, which is where most of the oil and gas companies are and where we would be if we were doing this in person, Houston is apparently a really good place for women in tech. Uh, so in cloud computing, big data storage and uh, collection and information security, there will be half a million new jobs between now and 2029 uh, in Houston. So it's great, but women still make 83 cents on a dollar, which is actually better than uh, the national average for everything. So um, there is a pay gap, um, but it is, it's better in tech. So really does diversity matter? Uh, and I found this quote, this is a quote from an oil and gas executive. By 2025, we're gonna be a millennial and Generation Z workforce, and they are inclusive and diverse. If your business is not, you're gonna get the bottom of the barrel workers. Um, it's, it's happening, it's coming, <laughs> kind of whether you like it or not. Does it matter? Why after uh, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, why did so many companies jump to make changes uh, and follow the, you know, follow the, the community, well, basically it comes down to money, as you might not be surprised, but millennial spending, which might surprise you, is estimated at $2.5 tr trillion. 90% of members of Generation Z believe that African Americans are treated differently and support Black Lives Matter. More than two-thirds of Gen Z think brands should be more involved in Black Lives Matter. So, there's money in this. It's not just, there, there is a business case for it that we've seen, um, and, but it is all about um, you know, catering to the next generation. And here are some of the business case uh, statistics. I've shown these before. Gender diverse companies are more likely to outperform. Ethnically diverse companies are more likely <clears throat> to outperform their non-diverse peers. 
Um, there is a business case, but that's, that should not be the only reason um, why companies move towards diversity. Improved gender diversity on boards are more likely to reduce energy consumption um, and to be better at social responsibility. And, uh, and of course, having women in more diverse, women are creating more diverse and inclusive workspaces. So um, the lever of change is the person who's willing to stand up for what they believe in and take the risks associated with it. Uh, and women are frequently the ones who are willing to take those risks. So I, this slide is uh, from last summer, but this came out in an article in Forbes uh, in April of 2020. The countries with the best coronavirus responses early in the pandemic all had something in common. Uh, and you can go find this article on Forbes if you're interested. It was very, it was very clever. Um, so we all have unconscious bias. Diversity is hard. Um, we, it is specifically called unconscious bias because we don't realize we're doing it. Um, and it can be problematic for workplaces, as we've all found. Um, and it, it's something that um, we need to work hard to fight against, uh, to first to recognize uh, and then to fight against. Um, gender is the first stereotype we learn as children. Um, and it affects the performance of a group that is stereotyped. Hey, you did a great job. Women can do HPC. It's not something we want to hear. Um, and if you're nervous about um, being stereotyped, you may not take the chances that you, that you would if you felt accepted and included. So we need to worry about those things. Um, again, this is a, a slide that I made earlier in the year, last year, but um, unconscious bias ha has an impact on systemic racism. Uh, and it is in hiring, it's not who you know, it's not, it's who you know, not what you know. So you hire people who, Look like you, you hire people from communities that you know, um, and it can have also disparate impacts on people in the workplace. And so we, these are things, again, that um, we need to look out for um, because, you know, this uh, another article uh, I was reading in uh, HBR, Harvard Business Review, diversity is uncomfortable. Um, and it's uncomfortable, but it needs to be uncomfortable. People believe that diverse teams breed greater conflict than they actually do. Um, it's harder uh, because you are required to listen to people who are not like you and try and learn uh, and be inclusive. But as we say in the gym, it's no pain, no gain. You, you do need to do it because it is harder, but it's worth it. Um, it's an important catalyst for creativity and deep thinking. It, um, only when people feel welcome and respected will the team be able to benefit from their unique perspective and experiences. So if diversity is seen as a social obligation, the goals will not be met because people, you think it's difficult. If you accept that it's going to be difficult, but it needs to be done, um, the outcomes are much better. So um, I'm gonna try and play this video. And I want you to think about how you feel at the end of the video and, and what you would have done or would you have done anything differently? There is no sound, um, there's only music. So we'll see how this goes. Hey, Melissa, I can't see the video. Oh, it's not running? Oh, I stopped. Duh, I forgot to share my screen. <laughs> well, technical difficulties. Hang on, sorry. That was really genius of me. Thank you for saying that. Uh, you don't hit the share screen button, it doesn't work. My apologies, we'll try that again. You see it now? Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Oops. Back to slides. Oh, come on. That's it. Okay, back to the slides. So um, that video, you can see it if you go look up uh, PNG, the look. Um, but, uh, and there's the, there's a link. Um, and it is intentional, you know, obviously what it is and, and think about how you felt, how you would have felt. Oops, what happened? Sorry. Uh, think about how you felt and how you would have felt, uh, if you had been sitting in those chairs or on that street uh, or in the pool. Um, it is something that's supposed to make us think. Uh, and I hope that it, that it does. And this happened actually on Capitol Hill two days ago uh, in a confirmation hearing. Vanita Gupta, who's a nominee for the Justice Department, uh, was asked about comments she had made about implicit bias. And she said, we all have implicit bias. It doesn't mean we harbor any racism, but there are unconscious assumptions and stereotypes. We all do it. Um, the senators on Capitol Hill were not amused by this, but uh, were some of them, I should say, but, uh, but we all do. Uh, and it is difficult to overcome and it's something we need to work at. So how, you know, how we work at it and how we look for it, I think once you see it, it's hard to unsee it. Uh, and some of the, com some of the panelists will, will discuss this later. There's, there's language that you can uh, look for in your job ads. I've talked about this at previous Women in HPC uh, presentations at Rice, um, using he or his for your default pronoun. Um, and uh, and using sharing your own preferred pronouns so that people are more comfortable sharing theirs uh, is a good strategy to use. So we've talked about um, all the, the different points of diversity. Um, diversity also impacted things that happened during COVID. So women are still down 5.4 million jobs from a year ago uh, compared to 4.4 million for men. Black women, single mothers, and those without college education saw the biggest impact. Uh, and women still to this day and uh, are in, are concerned about going back to work and the stresses of chair or uh, child care or school. It's hard to have a job interview when your kids running around um, and you have to, to take care of them. And and women, to be honest, don't want to appear weak uh, in the job market. So that's there's a challenge. There have been some good things to come out of the, the pandemic. There's been a lot of innovation. Um, we are not going back to the old normal. Uh, one of things that have uh, things that have improved, alternative manufacturing has come up, robotics has come up. Um, in medicine, obviously, we did a lot of great things to get together and, and get the vaccine out as soon as possible. Distributed energy generation is one of the things that's list, listed here from this uh, research that was done by Lux Research. Um, but there's also, because of the economy, a lack, there's going to be a lack of funding available for startups in the future. There'll be cuts to R&D. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things we need to look at is, is what's coming out of this, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and really, business as usual uh, is incompatible with social progress. So we need to change. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, and then I will stop sharing my screen. Um, Carla Allen uh, is a teacher at DelVal ISD here in Austin. Christina Valdica at Intel. Uh, Don Hunter, who worked with me at TAC um, and is our outreach coordinator. Christina works in the HPC group. I missed that. <laughs> Christina leads the HPC group at Intel. Um, Elizabeth, who leads the HPC group at BP. And Kelly Nolan, who is, uh, sorry, who is a coordinator for Simon Fraser University. So up in, uh, she lives in Ottawa. Simon Fraser's in Vancouver. It's a wonderful place. Uh, so let me stop there and stop sharing and we will have our little discussion. Uh, we have some topics and some questions that we had come up with uh, to talk to y'all about. Uh, and so we'll start through from there with um, sort of the, certainly initially the challenges uh, that women have had, particularly women, in uh, the working from home with COVID uh, and uh, how in-person conversations have happened or not happened uh, during this time. So I'm going to turn it over to Christina or Elizabeth, whoever wants to go first. Nobody's going first. 
<laughs> I find the mute button first. <laughs> um, so feel free to introduce yourself first. I forgot to say that. Please introduce yourself. Talk about why you're here, and then off you go. Um, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lover. Um, I, uh, as Melissa said, I'm uh, taking over leadership of the HBC MNBP after um, the exceptional Keith Gray is uh, retiring. Um, so those are big shoes to fill. This is a new role for me. Um, I have been with BP for 13 years now in a technology role. Um, I came to BP straight out of graduate school. I have a PhD in geophysics um, and have worked through the um, upstream technology research area um, as various roles, project leads, program leads, um, subject matter expert in seismic simulation, um, and have just been uh, promoted to uh, the HPC team now. Um, so uh, Christina, do you wanna introduce yourself before we get into anything else? So I am a senior director for HPC software at Intel. I've been with Intel about six years. Before that, I worked for the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Um, I started as a postdoc. Um, and at that time, I remember uh, telling myself I would be here for two years and then I'm done. Um, <laughs> I, um, I ended up staying about 20 years in uh, beautiful Champaign-Urbana, that's a little town in the cornfield in Illinois. Um, and um, throughout my life, so I started as an aerospace engineer and then throughout my life I've been um, in this very male dominated environment in school when I first my first job and all that. And I always took it for granted that that's, it is what it is. I just have to keep pace with everybody and not let myself be disrespected. And as I as I um, as I progressed through my life and also you know in in my in my career, I I started to be more deliberate about it and asking the questions. Why is that? Why do I accept the status quo? What can I do to change it? And it's not only about me. It's for everybody around me and everybody that will follow me. You know the younger people. And I have two daughters, so you know maybe that was also something that pushed me to to think about this in a in a more global scale in, in a time evolution. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Wonderful, actually, let's have everybody introduce themselves now uh, and then we'll go back to our questions. Sorry. Don, we can I'm gonna start picking on y'all. If you don't start talking, I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> Don Hunter. Uh, as Melissa said, I work at the Texas Advanced Computing Center at TAC with her. I work in the education outreach group and my heart and passion is really just motivating students and letting them know the opportunities that's available for them. My background is mechanical engineering, actually worked for an, or as an engineer for 10 years uh, before switching into education. And now I've worked in education for like 13 years. So it's actually interesting <laughs> that I've been working that long. Surprised them. But I, I absolutely just love showing people opportunities and showing people that they're really awesome and they have greatness in them. And just being able to be a part of uh, this panel of, again, just trying to see how I can help let people know how they can reach out to students, how they can, how students can benefit, how just exposure can be enough to put that spark in them to make them change their whole directory for their for their future. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Carla. My name is Carla Allen. I have been in the education field for 16 years now for K through 12. I am an educator who just doesn't teach in the classroom. I'm always looking for opportunities to expose my students to new ways and new things. And I feel that the more the education system in that K through 12 uh, starts to uh, expose our children at a younger age, they'll start to see themselves doing jobs that typically uh, society has not shown those faces. So I have been doing this for a long time. I've taught math uh, for 14 years and now I'm teaching the educational and training pathway here at Del Valley High School. Nate. And last but certainly not least, Kelly. Hi there, everybody. It's great to be here today. Um, I'm a strategic and international partnership manager at Simon Fraser University, but today I'm here 
uh, well, I used to be the former co-chair of Women in HPC, and uh, and I I run a small consultancy, and I, I focus on training uh, governance structures and executive teams on responsible equity, diversity, inclusion, um, and how I was involved in high performance computing. I don't have a fancy technical background. I was the dire <laughs> executive director of external affairs. I helped raise the money for the um, research computing system, national system across Canada here. It's so nice to meet everybody and hear everybody's background. Looking forward to today's session. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, back to Christina and Elizabeth. Um, we are, let's start with, you know, the challenges of working from home and how that has been different uh, in 2020 and how it has been. We've seen the, the news article was about how different it has been for women uh, and how much more women have taken on. Um, and how do you see that in your company? And, and how is it going to be when we start trying to go back to work now that we've all been told that everyone will be able to get their, their, their vaccination after May 1st? You know, how, how do we see that playing out? And, and how will women be impacted? Will women be impacted differently and how? Um, I suppose I can go first. I can um, just explain what my experience has been since uh, over the past year, I suppose. Um, so I, I have three kids. I have a nine-year-old daughter and I have uh, twin boys who are six years old. Um, they were in kindergarten last year. Uh, and once the pandemic hit and they were sent home, it sort of completely derailed their year. Um, and we, we tried to keep up with the virtual learning. My husband and I were both working from home. He teaches at a community college. Um, so all of his classes went online um, and we got ourselves set up, um, but it was honestly one of the hardest things I've ever done um, to try and manage working full-time plus um, my husband working full-time plus these three kids trying to get them to engage on these virtual platforms and do these exercises and submit, you know, things that they've, pictures of things they've colored and things like that, right? Um, and then when the summer came, it was, it was just easier. We could unplug from all of that virtual learning stuff and um, just take it easy for a bit. Um, and then of course there was the decision in September once uh, school started up again, do we go back? We had the option in our um, school district to either do in person, fully in person, 100% or 100% virtual. Um, and we debated back and forth about that a lot. Um, we eventually decided to put our kids back in school. Um, the two boys will redo kindergarten um, and pick up where they kind of left off. Um, and they've been doing that, they've been great. Uh, it was hard sending them in wearing their little masks every day and uh, with their bottles of sanitizer with them and um, making sure that they were, they were staying safe. Um, one of them tends to have a really slippery nose and that mask just doesn't stay up. But <laughs> we managed, we managed that. Um, as part of going back to school, we did do two weeks, was it two weeks? Um, of fully virtual online learning. And I, that was even harder than it was last year um, because we had Zoom meetings scheduled uh, between the three kids up to, was it 10 Zoom meetings a day? So call in, do 20 minutes, you know, log off, do some work, call back in, do some work. And balancing that with the meetings I was taking during the day. And, I, you know, again, that was just, it was completely impossible to manage. Um, and so we were extremely thankful to be able to send our kids back after that. Um, and so got through all of that, you know, the school year is going through, I've started a new job now, um, which is a lot more intense than my old job was. Um, so I'm taking a lot of more meetings, meeting a lot of new people. Um, and when the kids are home, it's, it's balancing the break-ins into the meetings, right? Um, and being able to handle sort of turning away for a second and just, you know, kind of talk to you in a minute and, uh, or, you know, having to log off a meeting or all of that. Um, so it happens. I think what's made it a lot easier has been my colleagues. Um, most of them are really excited when kids pop up or pets pop up um, in your video. Um, you know, if you hear my dog snoring, it's everybody wants to see them. Um, they will all sort of wave and say hi to the kids as they pop up. Um, and they're all 
very understanding. Um, and likewise, I try and be understanding with all of my colleagues who uh, may have their kids home. They may, you know, not have sent them back into school um, and just try and gauge the, the reaction of the parent um, and sort of understand, are they feeling uncomfortable? Can I talk to the kid or do I just completely ignore the situation and just keep focused on work? You know, you got to gauge who you're talking to and how they're going to react um, to their, their kids coming in and making sounds or, or various things, right? Um, so that's been one thing we've tried to balance. Um, I guess we can talk, a, uh, Christina, if you want to break in uh, at any point, go ahead uh, before we kind of move on to what our plans are for going back to the office. Yeah, a lot of this sounds very familiar. And I think one thing that everybody experienced is that the amount of work has actually increased. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder to collaborate over Zoom. It's, uh, you don't have the, the opportunity to just take uh, 10 steps, go to somebody's office and quickly ask a question. You're asking, you're sending an email, that person is not available at that time. Maybe in an hour they will respond to you and they misunderstood a question. And then you have to explain and type some more. And, um, and it becomes a whole production for the simplest thing that could have been solved in 30 seconds. And uh, that it's, it's not just one case, there's all these other cases. So everybody has been overloaded. And um, I'm sure you experienced that, that too. There is, there is that flow of the day that just goes and goes and goes. And it's very hard to, to be disciplined to find those breaks and say like, okay, now I'm stopping, my day work is over. And, and uh, it's, it's very hard, it's very hard. It, it just goes on and on and on and you feel like the whole week is dragging on and then you get to the weekend and you're exhausted. Um, and um, uh, I have to, to say our company tried to be very, very uh, supportive. There are all these communications and plans and trying to keep us safe. Of course, they had to deal with a lot of unknown. So many people wanted more answers, but only as much was available. Um, I think at a certain moment, they recognized how everybody was burned out that we got an extra day off. And it made such a big difference, right? Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, there's so many different kinds of situation and people deal with so many different kinds of challenges, right? Um, obviously, uh, even you have kids in school. Uh, I had uh, two young women in my in my team that had babies, right? How you deal with that? Um, uh, there, there are a lot of people that we hired out of school, and they're single, and they just moved to a new city, and now they're stuck at home, and they don't have a network. They haven't had the chance to make friends. So now they're at home by themselves and maybe they call their parents overseas, um, you know, every day, but it's not the same. So uh, a lot, a lot of challenges. We have, for example, a team in, in Russia. Um, um, you might know that people in, in Russia have very small apartment houses, not, not like here. Right, so they think about it to have a, a, a two bedroom, very small apartment and some kids running around and uh, uh, maybe your wife works too, you know, or your husband. How do you manage that in that environment? So a lot of, a lot of stress that came from that. So we're all ready to be, to be done with this. And, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, and I don't, I don't want to gloss over. There were all these, uh, these other things politically that happened last year. This was a very intense year with elections, with an increased awareness of the systemic racism that, that exists in our country, with um, a lot of people that um, took a stand and went out in the street, right? And all that added to the stress, um, I would say, especially for young people, for people that really feel about this. And that reflected also, the, it's very hard to, to be one person here and then one person at work. Uh, you're the same person, right? And you bring that into your workplace. And um, I would say that um, it put a big burden on our leadership. 
And I think everybody has good intentions, but sometimes you don't know how to handle the situation. Uh, we had um, a webinar about the, the, the topic was, uh, um, I would say Black, Black Lives Matters and political unrest. And this is the larger webinar I've seen at Intel. They were, you would just see that counter just pop, 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 pop. It was thousands of people joined it. It was amazing. And I saw a, a man in his, how would that say, 40. So, you know, a full grown person. And he was in tears saying, nobody's asking me how I feel. That's all I want to hear, that people care how I feel. So I'm, I'm getting emotional myself because it's, it's a very tough subject. Yeah, and, yeah. and we all have to deal with that when we go back, if we go back, right? Intel is one of those companies that's, that's letting people stay home, right? Well, um, going back, uh, well, there's some good things that came out of this, right? So for example, um, I have to say for my team and many other teams that I work with, They've been also very incredibly productive. So that was sort of the, the reward for that big cost that everybody put in. Um, we also have proven that we can work from home. We don't need to be in the office every single day, right? Uh, they had some doubts about that, our, uh, our leadership. Um, and um, now this is proof. This is, <laughs> uh, uh, there's, there's data, there's, there's not like somebody's opinion. This is a fact, right? So now we're trying, uh, we have a, a, a task force trying to figure out how would life look after this, right? What have we learned? How we come with more flexibility and how we help people and teams be more productive when we go forward. So uh, right now the thinking is uh, there will be this uh, hybrid work mode where you can be at home some days and in the office some days. Um, nothing is yet, you know, very um, prescriptive, you know, it's just all the thinking, but there is this door open, right? Um, we were told we were going to be still at home until the end of June. Uh, I'm very optimistic about the, the rate of vaccinations and hopefully uh, we will continue on that path and, and be able to, to be safe when we're all together. Um, but uh, I think... I would like to see a little bit more well-defined plans. And we're trying to influence that from, from a woman's point of view, right? Because there are unique challenges that women face. I don't wanna take all the conversation, so <laughs> please please jump in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, BP is, is thinking of the same things, right? How do we get people slowly back into the office and into some sort of, um, normal, more normal, new normal way of working. Um, and they've just come out and said, look, we're not expecting everybody to just full time back 100% into the office. We will, we will support flexible solutions. Um, on average, a 60-40 split between, um, you know, in office 60% of the time and 40 at home. Um, that means that with your team, you will be able to decide, you know, is it better for you to be full-time in the office, full-time at home, or some sort of mix in between? Um, but that, uh, it's going to be a challenge um, because it's not just as simple as you've got, well, it's not simple at all, but you've got all of the at-home things that you need to worry about, the childcare, the, the family issues, the, the home life versus the office life. Um, but to me, there's also a uh, um, just the, the comfort level that people have with um, switching back and forth, the context switching, you're constantly in the office one day at home, the next day back in the office. Um, we had a bit of practice at that in BP um, after Hurricane Harvey in, uh, was it 2017 or 18? Um, our offices were flooded. Um, and so we we were, it was nine months before we were allowed back into our main building. So we had some temporary space, which couldn't fit all of us. Um, and so what they had said was, all right, your team will come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and just the consideration of people who 
aren't uh, aren't comfortable with that constant. You're you know sitting at some floating desk one day. You come in, you plug in your laptop, and then the next day you're at home. And you know some people need that their personal space with their personal effects at their desk. Um, some people were perfectly happy to come in and sit anywhere and do their work. Um, and then there were you know I was somewhere in between. I, I I was okay with it, but at the same time I I do like some consistency. Uh, and so it's not just balancing what people's um, obligations are with home and work, but it's um, balancing their, um, what do you call it, cognitive diversity, mental di diversity um, in terms of how they like to work. Uh, so those are all sorts of conversations that we need to have with people. And the challenge of, you know, for people who come and go or for people, you know, if you're used to being there um, and, and how promotions happen, right? How to how do you know who's doing the work? And, and this was one of those things that has sort of been, as Christina said, sort of wiped away by everybody being working at home. Okay, everybody is being productive. We do know that this works and people are being productive. But, you know, there are managers who still are like, well, if I can't see you, I can't tell, you know, what you're doing. And so how do I know if I can give you a promotion or not or a raise? Are you, are you really performing? Are you faking it? Are you, you know, and that's, I think that's another consideration for this hybrid work model is if you're not seen and and sometimes it feels like if you're not seen they don't know that you're doing the work and you need to be seen and how do we start to balance that you know this is not we are not the the consultants the strategists from McKinsey who get to figure out how this is all going to work but I think for to, to start to think about that and for managers to start to think about how do you um how do you sort of equally see your people and understand that the product productivity is happening, whether they're sitting in their office at work or sitting in their office at home. I, I work in a government town in, in Ottawa and uh, it's going to change the city completely. Um, the, the government has decided they don't want to hurt everybody into those small cubicles. Uh, they want to stop traffic jams uh, in the, in the morning. They're hiring uh, government uh, workers usually had to move to Ottawa for the major government jobs. They're hiring across the country. Uh, this is an this is a you know stuffy old government departments that thought working from home meant you were you weren't working to the point now where they're making it their policy, and I and for me like reflecting on the questions I work with a lot of departments to, in partnership and the questions they have to answer um, is really changing a lot of the discussions those awkward discussions around obvious systems of inequity. I mean the Justice Department now has to say well we let people out of jail that were low risk offenders and there was no impact to public safety. So how do we justify the tax dollars of those um, incarcerated people and, and are coming to universities to help us unpack these challenging questions <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and having to uh, really reflect on policies and, and uh, ways of doing things. Huge reflection now on the word, uh, the age of 18 as, as being um, adulthood when the impacts are, are really uh, really clear that children coming out of the foster care system and children uh, 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 navigating <clears throat> all kinds of things, homelessness, uh, the impacts of poverty are harmed by that 18 age uh, and would be much better served to have the systems oh. serve them until 23 or 24 before they had to navigate the adult system. The very fact that 18 existed, the data was showing, was guaranteeing sort of their lack of success, almost a guarantee towards another form of incarceration because they're left at 18 with, with no money, and no infrastructure. Yeah. And so um, so the to see the twists and turns of some very awkward conversations when the evidence now is right in, in their face, you know, people are saying you're calling the frontline workers here heroes, but they don't have paid sick leave still. We're a year in. Um, a lot of them don't have their citizenship yet or pathways to citizenship. So they're your hero. When they're when they're you know cleaning uh, your your elderly mom in the home's uh, body, but they're not your hero when, when after this or when and, and what is their compensation equal? You know, um, the, the the here in Canada, fifty six percent of women are in those frontline jobs, retail front time, fifty six percent, and so they've been severely affected. And uh, and so knowing, like you know, the, it's sort of like you're living in three worlds. Your world, where you're, you know, you, you can work. For, I, I work from home, anyways. This didn't do anything but get me closer to my colleagues in Vancouver, <laughs> and and I could see them instead of being a, a microphone in the middle of the boardroom table. And so that was really wonderful for me. And and just the innovation around that, like we we can never, you know, we I think we can't ever say 
well, that's not the way it should work, or we can't do that because we've just flipped the table. And so I'm, I'm wondering if people are going to embrace that opportunity to think differently. I, I'm, I'm also skeptical, but I, I, I wonder if we're going to have uh, some collective going, whoa, you know, what's going on here? We could do things a lot more differently, and and a lot of, a lot of um, thinking around criteria and how criteria. One size fits all thinking is actually uh, upholding the systemic uh, systems of exclusion and racism. And so I'm taking this year as a year to learn and I'm, I want to emerge in a different way at the end of this, because if we don't take the images and the lessons learned to heart, then then I, I you know, this, it's a huge loss of opportunity to progress forward. So I'm hoping that that energy stays, that collective optimism to we can get this done. We did a vaccine in less than, what, 15 months. We thought that was impossible. We thought it was impossible to work from home. People were denying that systemic racism exists. We can, none of those things are possible right now uh, if you have any sort of uh, ability to see the world around you. And so I'm wondering, is there going, is there, is there hope? Can we accelerate the change that's needed? But I. I'm almost afraid to be hurt by it because we've we've got the potential and are we going to let that potential go away again? That's sort of been my preoccupation. Wow. I think I share your, your skepticism on that too. I, I worry about going back and uh, again, like you said, the microphone on the table, right? Do we, are we going to instantly lose all of this recognition that people aren't all going to be present in the room at the same time? Um, and then coming back to the, promotions issue and you know knowing that people are working is is one thing and then there's also the the networking and communication um, because what I've noticed is all of my communications almost all of my communications with people are scheduled right can I chat with you let me put some time on your calendar um, so we've almost completely lost that impromptu I need to just walk down the hall and talk to somebody and the people who aren't comfortable reaching out to people you know cold calling people and all that sort of thing um they're gonna fall behind unless we are mindful of that yeah, one thing i noticed that was really interesting here we were i was presenting a proposal to the parliamentary black caucus the uh, the federal government the national government and that was online and normally you would have to pay for a plane ticket fly to ottawa have a hotel room and taxi money to you know get up to the hill um and and groups that groups were presenting to parliament from their apartments from their across the country from the north where you know it costs you know more than it costs to fly to europe to come back to ottawa and so that exercise in uh, voices that are normally muted in the halls of power having ability to zoom in um and i had you know people from the bc government booking b2b movie meetings with me that would never happen. You'd have to, you know, go through so much to secure that meeting. And, and then, you know, and, you know, all kinds of pomp and ceremony and agenda setting and all this stuff. And we, he just clicked on the link and started chatting to me about an initiative he wanted to have at the university. So the, for, the absence of formality, I think, has some signs of, uh, of, of being able to have more voices in the club um, and, and hearing you know, that very important hearing of different experiences so we don't keep doing the same things over again. I'm wondering if that'll continue as well. Just to kind of add to that for myself, I've seen the positives of me just being able to get invited or be part of meetings that I normally wouldn't be able to because they're not expecting a high turnout. So they send it to everybody. <laughs> so you don't have to be, because you don't have to be a member at that point. And just being able to be in on different conversations and be able to ask questions to people who are in positions that I may not be able to ask, like prior to this has been great. Um, working from home, actually, I think I work less now than I worked when I was in the work workplace because of the hours that I would actually spend at my desk because my thing was, okay, if I'm gonna work, let's try and do it all there so I can minimize myself working from home. And now I've, I like time management anyway, so it's okay, this is when I start. This is when I finish, I'll take my computer, I'll put it away and I'll put it like inside the desk where I don't mess with it. I have like set times on like, there are certain things I watch. I don't, I was telling someone else, like I don't binge watch or anything really. So I have a good schedule and I feel like I have more life now of like my own personal life than I did when I worked. And I, I mean, again, I like seeing people. I like working with people. I prefer to just be out and about. Um, but it has been a benefit. It has, like for me at least, 
I, I definitely can see lots more benefits that I've had. I mean, I'll even say grocery shopping. I personally love grocery shopping. And so I used to go down every aisle just to see what they had and what they had on sale and actually cut my grocery costs down. <laughs> now, now I can't walk down every aisle and I just pick up the things that I actually need. So, and it goes very fast and you're done. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, I've tried to do it like, I'll just put ketchup and see the different brands. But again, it's not what, like I, like I said, I could easily go into the store for orange juice and spend an hour. And it was fine to me because it was, I was just browsing to see what else they had. And I picked up some barbecue sauce and I picked up some bread and I picked up, you know, but not anymore, but it's, but again, like I said, I still see the positives. There's, there's a lot of positives that I can say from working from home. And I think one of the most interesting things that's happened is I've, as Don said, like I've participated in webinars and meetings and there are so many more of these things available. Um, the University of Texas last summer did um, a, a seminar, a weekly seminar for how many weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, that was the history of the black experience. And it was amazing. And I have to say, there's a lot of stuff that's not in our history books that, you know, or, or there was a little bit of it and to hear it, to learn it, I mean, it was heartbreaking, a lot of it. it and it was hard to, to hear, but then it made me wanna learn more. Then you start doing more research and you start thinking, okay, this is really why this is happening. And th there's more of a reason to fight this once you know the history. Because you can't say, I didn't know about it and it's not my fault, I wasn't here, right? That's 200 years ago, I wasn't here. Well, guess what? You still have to work on it. You still have to fix it. The whole point is the, the feeling of empathy, the, the understanding is so much harder to do. And it is uncomfortable. And that's the thing, diversity is uncomfortable but you have to do it. Um, and if, <laughs> that's the thing that I've come away with. I was reading that article again this morning and I was just thinking, oh my God, you know, we really need to be uncomfortable because it makes things better eventually. Yeah, if I could add to that, like what you guys were saying, like for me personally, um, I'm a teacher. So not having kids in the classroom, I'm in my classroom right now and it's very empty, right? Um, we have a 6A school. Um, we have 3,500 kids and we're averaging about 70 kids per day coming into the building. Um, the most of my kids are at home due to a lot of just the fear of, can I get COVID? And we had a lot of numbers at first. And so what I want to say is even the, um, the slide that you brought up about how there was a big disparity with women working, right? And now that, that disparity has hit um, Black women and minority or women of color a lot more. And so even though we've come into this, oh, we got technology, a lot of people still don't understand the, the children who were already at risk, right? Yeah, we gave them a Chromebook, but they're probably in the country where the Wi-Fi is so bad. They right. can't even get on. Every time they get on, the, the thing is buffering. The kids are getting frustrated. The parents are getting frustrated. Um, we're also putting a lot of our parents that were already at a disadvantage because now they're like, do I pay the internet bill? Or do I put food on the table? So these are some things that, you know, I, I would say we still have to look at. And one of the things about the diversity, like one of the things that I keep hearing schools say, like how our kids are going to come back um, with their mental status because you've been away or you've been in your own little bubble, right, for this long period of time. And now we're going to say, hey, just go back into school and think that now we want all of these people around us, right? So there's a mental health thing that we're not taking in um, consideration, but also um, I've had many conversations about, it's not just that, but it is the social injustice and unrest. And I see a lot of companies, um, when the George Floyd came out, for most black people, we were not, it was sad to see, but we were not surprised, right? This has been going on forever. And um, I remember, you know, the conversation started coming out, you know, some of our, you know, uh, white family, right? Now, you know, um, I'm so sorry. And one of the things we've always said, like, it's not an apologetic kind of thing. Like you didn't, your knee wasn't on his neck, right? But there is some undertones, right? There are undertones of how we deal with conversation. And are we taking time now beforehand, before we bring everybody back into the same room? And we know that there's a pecking order, right? There's a pecking order in the race and there's a pecking order in gender. 
Like, and I think a lot of times in that pecking order, how do we see ourselves, right? And then how do other people view us? I think a lot of times, I know sometimes when I come into a room, I'm just gonna be very transparent. I'm here and I was so glad for the invite, but personally there was a shrinking on the inside, right? Because I am this black individual with other white people. Am I good enough? So these are private conversations that we have. And I don't know if as women, if you have them, but I'm in the math field. And usually when I'm in the room, who, are, who do we see? A bunch of men. In that same process, I'm not saying they look at me differently. I'm having these personal conversations with myself. Am I good enough? Will my voice be heard? Can I say this? And it might do a little different. Or if I say this, they dismiss it. But if Johnny boy over here says it, it's the greatest idea. So I think that we all have these um, inner Do you see all the nodding heads, Carla? Yeah, we're like, all nodding along with you. And so we're all, we all have this. So then it is that uncomfortable conversations. Can we have these conversations and have an honest, transparent conversation? Can we look at the data? Can we look at and see what's going on? And what can we do all as an individual basis? Like, I can't go change the whole world. But what can I do right now? How can I be the change that I want to see? So even I have to, because when, I'm going to just be honest, when Miss Hunter, Dawn called me and she was like, Carla, do you want to do this? I was like, what am I doing? Right? <laughs> and um, when you look at, and I'm looking at all of you great people on the panel, and I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I don't want to say it, but I was like, I'm just the teacher. They are, are in these like, big high jobs and you know you have like all of these things and so these are things that I had to deal with right personally right and I think that those are things that we have to say what are our own struggles that we see because of what society has said right and then how can we as individuals take those things that are in society or that we consider the norm and then change the narrative how can we start with ourselves and not just have conversation, but also say, what is a solution or what is something I can do to change the narrative so that we are more inclusive and that we are more empathetic and we are just kind and thoughtful to one another and understand that even though you might say something that is wrong, that we can say that you probably didn't really mean it that way. Like it was just how you usually say it and that we can be okay with that. So that was just something I just wanted to add. So let me ask a question to all of our attendees. Uh, all of you have on your screen a raise hand button. If you have experienced imposter syndrome, which is exactly what Carla just described, raise your hand. Every day, deeply. <laughs> but if you're watching, if you, if you look at the attendees list, everybody, well, half the attendees list, those who were able to find the hand, I'm, and I would wager that more people than, than, than are showing, but half the attendees at least have raised their hand. So it is everywhere, it is everyone, uh, and we all go through it. And it is the- uh, Someone wanted you to repeat the question because their computer went out. Oh, um, please raise your hand, use your little raise hand button. If you have experienced imposter syndrome, if you have walked into a room or been asked to be on a panel or been invited to do something and you thought to yourself, they're going to find out I'm a fake. I don't, I don't actually know what I'm doing. I, they're going to figure that out. Um, somebody's going to find out. Well, I think I'm going to challenge you on this one a little bit. Yeah. So uh, definitely imposter sy um, syndrome exists. But the reason it exists is that we had all these experiences in school and in our careers where we were put down, where we wouldn't listen to. And it's not because we're women, it's because we had to endure those kinds of experiences. So I, I want to push back on this thing that women have this imposter No, it's not all. It's not all. And they're holding, the, yeah, and, no. and they're holding themselves back. And that's no. the, the second thing is, that there are systemic injustices 
in all organizations, and I would say, including at Intel, which is doing a great job at this moment, trying to have, you know, parity in terms of salary, representation and all that, you know, there is a fight, but there are also these subtle um, um, institutionalized uh, biases and, and uh, barriers that women have to face. And then I don't want to hear to some executives saying, well, but you know, they don't raise their hand. They mean the women, right? Or, or the minorities. Why didn't they take those opportunities? They all have this imposter syndrome. And that's not always true. There's a lot of barriers that we have to, cha to, to challenge and pass and those barriers don't exist for other people. Yeah. It's a symptom of all the impacts of the stereotype and gender bias. It's a symptom of it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. I say even being a minority female, it's still different for me than it is for most everybody yeah. else on this call as well. I mean, Carla and I will have some more similarities, but it's still, there's certain things where, like if I said, you know, somebody treated me misfair or they were, you know, treated me wrong or wouldn't sell me something like, or gave me the little comments about, well, do you know how expensive this is? Cause I've had that happen. Um, I mean, I was buying something. I look young, I worked as an engineer. People don't know that. And even though I'm black and I've experienced that, other people have experienced it. However, I would still say I've probably experienced it more and it's more, and this is where I guess it's different too, because like I'm 45. So when you talk to people who are 25, they see it different. Like how uh, Carla was saying, you know, sometimes people don't mean it that way. Our age group was taught to give them a pass, understand that people are stupid. And I mean, no, it is, I mean, it's right, wrong, and different. It's however you want to, you know, process it and make it okay. But people don't know any better. Like I personally went into engineering. I was good in math and it was because I didn't like people. And so it was my way to work alone because in engineering back in the nineties in the early two thousands, we worked alone for the most part. Like we did our part and then we came in the group and said what we did and we walked away and it was excellent. That's what I wanted. It wasn't until I was in engineering that I actually realized I like people and all people weren't bad, but it's the, <laughs> But no, but if you're used to, I mean, it's like I said, Carla can add to this. There are certain things being black that you're brought up understanding. And it's like, if you get a chance, I say, read, um, why do all the black kids sit in the cafeteria, cafeteria together? together by Beverly Daniel Tatum. And it's I'll a put good the link book. in the chat. Yeah, it's a good book. It, I mean, to tell you more about the black life and a black experience because for me, there's just, there are lots of things that I just know to do. I grew up in a predominantly white area. Um, I have, my mom has 10 other brothers and sisters. My mom's number seven. So I have about 13 cousins that are older than me. I probably got like 60 that are under me, but I have tons of cousins, first cousins, second cousins, however you want to look at that. But it's, I've always, I've grown up around black people because I have a huge family and we do everything together, but I went to school in a predominantly white area. So I recognized my place, if you will, because of school. They taught me like, okay, you're in the classroom, you can do this. But my black family taught me to be strong and to be resilient and to, you know, not care what other people, like my mom taught me I can do anything. And I still feel that to this day. If I want to be an astronaut tomorrow, I guess I'm going to be an astronaut tomorrow. And I feel it. I don't want to be an astronaut. <laughs> and so I'm not an astronaut. But you know what, I'll be rooting for you. <laughs> you can do it. But no, but I, I say that and I don't I say it in jest, but I hundred percent in my heart believe I can be whatever I want to be. And there's nothing that someone's gonna stop me in being that. Now, with that, I also have the internal, I need to fight for myself. So if I'm in a situation and I feel like you're not hearing me, I'm going to keep pushing. And it's just like, you know what? You don't like me anyway. So I'm going to keep pushing and getting my point across. By the end, you're going to get it. And I'm going to walk away and be me. So it's the, there's a lot of internal things that I feel like being a minority. And again, being black is very different than being Hispanic. So it, it's, it's even saying certain things. Like when someone says, oh, I understand what you went through. I'm like, 
actually you don't and it's actually insulting when you tell me you do because then you've just diminished my pain like I, I somebody had put a post together about the trauma from uh, the snow that we had in Austin and if you lived in the Austin area you may have had it in the Houston area when you've had hurricanes but here people lost power and they lost water so I had power, only lost power for like an hour, but I didn't have water, running water for like four days. I can tell you, I remember the sound when the water first came on. I remember the first time I flushed the toilet, like with the handle and not me dumping water in it. I remember going to get like, but I, every time I was getting after the snow started to melt, I went to the gutter drains and just put a bucket underneath them because it was running water and I didn't have to melt it. And I came and filled up the tub but it was the, even though that happened, what, like a month or so ago, I still know I have trauma from it. That was four days. So imagine being 45 and the trauma that I've learned up to this point. Like I've learned certain habits. I've learned that I have to, like people will say whatever to get what they want. These are things that I've seen over my lifetime. So for someone to come in and say, oh, you can trust me. I'm like, <laughs> good luck. But it's the, but people have to recognize, I feel like that as well, and recognize that people have been through a lot. And it's not necessarily for you to say you agree, like you, or you've been through it, but just that you understand where they're coming from. Just like you'll take it, put it in a bubble, and don't add to it. I know, I see somebody say. So. Oh, Kelly can talk to this one. Uh, can you please speak to the importance of needs assessment when launching DEI initiatives for diverse groups, i.e. women, Latin, Hispanic, Black? That's pretty much what I'm going to be talking about, um, yes. <laughs> that, we don't, that we don't take a data-driven driven approach. And in fact, the data has been around for years and years and years and years. Uh, but if I say too much, <laughs> my, my, my little presentation is <laughs> going to be... Steal your own thunder. Um, so Rosie, thank you for that question. We will hold that question until after we break, um, because that's what Kelly's going to talk about, uh, and then we'll launch into the the, for the bigger Q and A after that. Um, since Dawn has already started down that road of let all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria, um, and how um, how so we we did want to talk a little bit about um, George Floyd and and how all of that impacted. Um, people's work life, people's life life. Um, and we touched on that a little bit, the, the, the younger students. I actually wanted to ask you about um, the younger people, because you said at 45, you see things differently um, and you're willing to give people a pass. And I think what people need to understand is the younger generation is not willing to give them a pass anymore. Right, that's more of why I say it is because we're, we're more tolerant, I would say our generation, my generation, but the younger, because even when I talk to, to college students and I would be, oh, okay, well, you know, make sure when you go in the interview, you do this, because this is what they're expecting. They're like, I don't care. They don't accept me. It's, this is this, you know, and I'm like, okay, you can do that. <laughs> but there is, a, there definitely a difference. And they even talk about like in that book, they talk about the difference between the older generation versus the younger. I mean, I would say that which way is better? I don't know, I, I don't wanna say you pick, but the choice that I've, I've went with and I've chosen, chosen whichever one to stay mm -hmm. with is for me to, to give people a pass because I want people to give me a pass. I'm not perfect, I make mistakes, I say stuff that are, that is, you know, inappropriate, inconsiderate, N not, I'm saying not intentionally. No, okay. yeah. But it's the, my friends will check me and be like, that was rude. I'm like, what did I say? Or, you know, like my mom will be someone who will check me and she'll be like, why did you say that? I'm like, well, because it's this. She's like, you said it in the wrong tone. I'm like, oh, okay. What I was saying may have been right, but the tone behind it was wrong. Or like, I, I like to tell people all the time, you can say the right words and you have the wrong heart behind it. And you could say the absolute wrong words. And I know your heart behind it is right. And I'm like, it's okay. So, and you, I see Carla smile because her and I have had the conversation before of um, you almost have to know the person and you have, and I don't even want to say you have to know the person, you just have to see their intentions. People, like I like to say, if you listen to people talk, if I listen to you put people down all day, I already know you're putting me down too. 
So you can come in front of me and say, oh, I love everybody and you're so sweet. I've already heard you put down 50 other people. I know I'm no different. So it's, you're teaching me who you are through our conversations. And I'm watching you to see who you are through conversations. And I don't know if everybody pays attention to that. Like we do that with our summer camps. I'm, I'm big on, like I, I pretty much don't watch any videos where people trip over things or they fall or their underwear is showing and you know, people are videotaping it. Just because for me, I don't wanna get where I see something like that and think it's funny because when I'm around students, they'll also think that I'm laughing at them. So it's the, you have to be a consistent person throughout. And Carla, go ahead, because I know I'm talking a lot about. No, I was just saying like, um, I, I, like again, so I was out with a friend uh, just yesterday and we were sitting and I call her a friend and she's not the same color as my, me. And she's, you know, even older than me and I love her. And I was just sharing with her how my cousins moved down from Michigan and they now live in Dallas. And I was like, oh, you want to see their house? And I showed her the house. And the first thing she said was, wow, how could they afford a house like that? Now, I haven't had the conversation with her yet because I was so taken back by what she said, right? And I think if I could just do a little, so this is the teacher in me, I want to do if everyone can just put their 10, their, all their fingers up, and I'm going to give you some statements. And if that statement applies to you, put a finger down. Okay. okay. I hope everybody's ready. So if it applies to you, put a finger down. So the first statement, have you ever been followed in a store unnecessarily? Okay. Have you ever had someone cross the street to avoid you passing them? Have you ever had someone clinch their purse in an elevator once you got in? Have you ever been accused of not being able to afford something expensive? Have you ever been given a pass um, for a citation that you might have deserved? Have you ever been stopped or detained by a police officer for no reason? Have you ever had to teach your child how not to get killed by the police? Have you ever been called a racial slur? Have you ever been, had someone touch your hair without permission? Have you ever, has anyone ever thought of you as being in the same socioeconomic class and thought you were the same as everyone else? So basically, have you been there and like everybody like here, you all make the same money, you all do the same thing, right? Have you ever been questioned about buying something expensive and they questioned the type of job you had? Okay, so when you look at that and there's more, usually the people of color have way more fingers down. Yeah. And that's just how it is. And so when we say certain things like the generation Dawn and I are from, we were taught when we go to school, you have to be the best because the first thing they're going to see is your color. I never knew color was an issue. And that's another thing too. Like, when did you know, like if everyone can put in the chat, at what age did you know your, that your race was an issue? That race was the first thing. When did that ever come up? And for me, when it's people of color, it's much younger that you find out that your blackness or the pigmentation of your skin, there's a difference in you. And so from that point on, like Christina was saying, I get what she's saying. We're taught as young people, right? If you're, if you're a, a girl who likes math, you're also taught, oh, even the, the teachers you had, they were like, oh no, you can't answer that question or you can't come to this advanced class because we were girls. Like we were taught that that's not what we should do. This is a man's world in this area, right? And so if you think about it, that has been taught to us over time. If this has been taught to us over time, sometimes we believe it, right? We know that sometimes we can do better at a job than our counterpart, but if he's a man, why does he get paid more money? My kids and I, we just looked at a study. It doesn't matter 
which, um, how much education we have, women are paid, what, 20 to $30,000 less than the man. And we have the same criteria, the same experiences, the same successes. And so we know, and that's what I was saying, we have to start within us and how we can start building that relationship, having those conversations, because it's only going to start with us. And I'm not trying to be, um, what I want to say, I'm not trying to say like, you can empathize with me, but you will never know how it is to be a black woman, right? A man will never know how it is to be a woman. And, And like I said before, there is a pecking order. This pecking order has been here for centuries. It's not like it just came yesterday. And that's like you said with the George Floyd thing, I believe it was the outrage of everybody being at home. Think about it. We were all, we were all in our house. Our lives were disrupted. And now we saw this video. And I believe, and I am great. Like when I was on the news, I saw more people that were not of color protesting. And that's what we need. I am not gonna... Um, Martin Luther King said it first, if there's, a, if there's an injustice, right? Black people can scream to the top of the world, but if people that are not black don't see the same injustice, we are still gonna have the same thing. It's just like in the engineer field, if men doesn't see that it's an issue and that it's wrong, one thing that I can say, if you look at Kobe Bryant's life, the reason why I feel he was so impactful is because he now started to shift how people see women in the athletic field. He shifted that paradigm to say, no, these women, they can play just as good as men. They should be making more money just as men. But who had to make that stance? A man. When we are having troubles as colored women, who's going to have to make that stand? It can't be me and Dawn because everybody's just going to think we're complaining we don't have anything else to do and we're insensitive and um why do you feel that way I don't treat you that way and then you shift it on you and like we said before I I'm not I like my white women I love you like there's no I'm just being honest right it's the truth I'm not blaming you for what happened years ago but what I am saying is I need your support The other thing I'm saying to you, when you ask me what I need, really listen, because what happens, I see, we'll tell you what we need, and then somewhere in the conversation or when you leave, you come back and give us something that we didn't even ask. It wasn't what you wanted, yeah. It was not what we needed, and I think that goes into the realm of just being a woman as well, right? We see that. We'll tell them this is what we need, and then the good old boys go have this private meeting. And we're like, that's not what we said. And you came back with something totally different. Yes, that's, and I think that was Rosie's point with her question about the um, intentional, um, the, the needs assessment is what he is, is making sure that the people that you are trying to help are in the room when you are trying to decide how to help them. It's, it's, there was that joke of a picture of, the women's health discussion in the previous presidential administration when it was all men sitting around the table. You know, you can't talk about women's health without women being there. You can't talk about how to help the, the, the diversity uh, in your company and how to improve it without bringing in people who are from those diverse communities uh, and not just black, but Hispanic and, and Asian and all of the other communities that we're trying to help here, right? You, you can't just say, we're gonna hire more women or you know, we're gonna help women, but not talk to women about, and it's not just about the hiring, right? It's also about the retention. This is the things that we've done at, at our women in HPC conferences in the past. It's not just about going out and looking for new and different candidates in, in other places. It's also about once they're in, making them feel welcome and included and keeping them there, right? It's not just, oh, I hired two black people, I'm done, right? It's you know, making sure that they feel in, included in the company and invested and want to stay in the company. Um, and I know, because I've talked to Dawn about it, that TAC didn't feel that great when she started. And we are all uh, incredibly glad that she stayed because uh, Dawn is awesome. 
Um, but it's it's hard and it's something that we all need to work on. And, and Carla is right, we need allies. And that's one of the things that Kelly has talked about in the past, um, yeah. you know. I was just gonna say, I was just going to say when Carla asked when we were introduced to the differences of race and I had sort of as a child, we lived in Montreal and suddenly my dad over 48 hours decided he wanted to go teach up north. My dad's also a teacher. And so at five years old, <clears throat> I was probably one of two you know, little white girls in this community of, of uh, that was a Cree community. And they had names for, for me. They had names like uh, Wamst nowhere assuming that I've experienced anything the same, but it was, it was, I think, why I've worked in equity um, to look for in equity seeking mission driven organizations my entire career is because you, you literally saw the impacts of the Indian Act and colonialism uh, live and, um, and their fight for self determination and this this collection of 8, 13 communities were led by Billy Diamond and Ted Moses, and they were the first indigenous leaders um to uh successfully negotiate with the province and the federal uh government to have self-determination their own school boards their own um their own everything still to this day they're not allowed to get a mortgage uh for a home or leverage their assets in saskatchewan they just stopped alerting uh social services when an indigenous woman has a baby the the canada gets this pass all the time and i i, I that but it was really a wonderful education to be the only one of a small group in a homogenous organization. I think if we all had that experience, the beauty of it also, the ability to learn and engage and understand different cultures and different ways of doing indigenous knowledge and decision-making teaching is, is, is very different than the way we traditionally have schools down here. And then to come back down to what we call Southern Canada, where it's completely different and to see these attitudes that an indigenous person was something alien, something that we didn't, we never even talked to it, something that was trying to take something back, steal back from Canada when you know Supreme Court decisions have, have sort of determined that we've stolen these resources it was a real lesson in, in the ways major systems um, work and policies develop to exclude and and keep out um, certain groups in Canada. And so uh, it's motivated me with my work ever since. But but having that experience of extreme injustice just be about something that you have no control over. Is, is a meaningful experience and it, it, it teaches you um, it teaches you that care and how we engage with people and how you see the person in front of you is more important than anything else like it just literally if you have that experience it's you understand that how we treat each other and engage is the most important thing and then it's, it's quite hard to be in such a world where that is not center the pandemic to me has shown that care is an afterthought it's an afterthought for our seniors it's an afterthought for I mean, suddenly we're expected to homeschool children and work full time and nobody thought that might be hard or 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 old people in these homes that are not properly equipped. The impacts and of poverty and the, the shame that we put around poverty so we can't talk about those experiences. Um, it's just been it's almost like a live, you know, a live, another lived experience and, and to meet people that are still blind to it. I'm finding really challenging, um, really, really challenging. <laughs> So I don't know if anybody else can uh, sort of see that, but I just, I just sort of, how can we be so blind collectively, constantly, and consistently? You know. Well, I guess for some it's just a convenient blindness. I mean, I have a, a tough time to believe that they don't see it; they choose not to see it. There was an Atlantic article about that that said there's just no consequence whether they care or not. Often, right? There's no consequence, and so I, I firmly believe we need. We need these demonstrations. We need um, both incentives and sticks. Uh, in Canada, the universities here were told to nominate top researchers for uh, research chair funding. The minister at that time happened to be a woman. They, the university presidents came with a slate only of men. And she said, go back and find me gender parity and don't tell me you can't find a candidate. And they're, we can't find a candidate. There's no women in this field. And she was clear. That was her stick. And guess what? It was a miracle. Them. <laughs> what? People like you exist. You know? <laughs> There's actually women in STEM. You know? so, um, and so that but changed. You see how she had to support that issue, right? And I to. think that's what I'm saying. Like if we're in these positions and I see that in the chat, it says, how does support look like? Again, ask me what I need. 
but then don't tell me what I need. And then when I give it to you, then you come back and tell me all the excuses of why you can't. So I'm going to just be like, I, I've worked in high risk areas all of my life. And when you see kids of color, a lot of people will say, those kids are not going to amount to anything. They're not going to be this. They're not going to be that. They can't do that. One thing I can say about having TAC and having Dawn come to my school every year to talk to my kids, I am going to tell you, no, my students are not the first ones to sign up. And I'm going to tell you why. It's all of those lists of things that I told you before. They all say, I am not good enough. Who tells me that I can go do this? And, and that's the conversations I have. Miss Allen, I'm not good enough. And then it's the other, what all teenagers would say. I'm not going to spend my time building Roblox over the summer. Come on, I want to relax. I'm done with school, right? And that has nothing to do with color. That's just being a kid, right? But I noticed that in our um, area, a lot of my parents just don't know. It's not that they don't want. So whenever there's code, to, um, uh, I don't know all of them, Don helps me with all the names, but it's all the programs. I literally tell my kids, you're going to sign up. Now they'll tell me they won't, but yes, you are, because I have that relationship with them. And then after they tell me I'm not going, I go, that's okay, because then I'm going to call mom and dad. And then I tell mom and dad how great this program is, all the things that they're going to learn and that they need to give it a chance. And I think that's one of the things, like when I was reading, like, how do we get more people in Intel? How do we get more women in oil and gas? The one thing that I looked up, I had to do some research myself. When I looked up on all the jobs of oil and gas, who knows of those jobs? <laughs> like, I'm not trying, like, who goes around saying, I want to be a geoscientist? Like, when you ask little kids what they want to be, or who even says things like, I want to be a hydro surveyor? Come on, like... <laughs> Who knows of these names? Well, how do you get people excited about things they don't know? You have to be able to go into areas you typically wouldn't go into. And that's what I mean by us checking ourselves. We feel more comfortable when we go to places that look like us. Let's just be honest. I am more comfortable. If you stick me in a room with people that don't look like me, I am in my head. Am I good enough to be here? Can I do this? Can I do that? Will my voice be heard? Will they accept me for who I am? And everybody goes through that. Are you willing to go to a place that you would typically not go to reach the people that we say we want to include, right? And that, and that goes everywhere. Like if you grew up in a religious home and your parents told you that gay and LBG community is not good, you're not gonna feel good going into a place where there's a lot of gay and transgender people. Let's just be honest with that. And people don't want to say that, right? Because then people look at you weird. And that's what I mean about, I'm a huge self-reflector. And I was in that age, like Dawn said, we were taught and I went to a majority white school. But let me just give you some context. I grew up, and let me just show, I grew up in Michigan. And if anybody knows about Michigan Avenue, Michigan Avenue- You go like this, Okay. Right? Put your hand up and you point. Yeah, you know anything. So Michigan Avenue runs, from Michigan all the way to Chicago. You can take that same thing. But there was, if you're on one side of Michigan Avenue, I grew up my first younger year in a very affluent black neighborhood. Everywhere I went, it was a black owned jobs. We got our bikes uh, fixed by a black owner. My parents, the schools were going down. They weren't good schools. She even went to those schools. Then they moved us across the road on the other side of Michigan Avenue. Our high school got shut down and I had to be bused to an all white school. This was in 1980, in the early eighties, I was bused to an all white school. The white people left in droves. Like I'm not talking about like they were selling their homes. They're like, we're not coming here. I was in seventh grade and that was the first time I heard the N word. I never knew of the N word. I grew up with people who, I was just the person. My color was never an issue. I was just a little girl learning. So being seventh grade, being bused to this, and the N-word came from a person that I thought was my friend. He didn't see me coming behind him. And he said, I wish these N people 
would go around the track and do our laps for us. We shouldn't have to do them. They should do them. It was the physical fitness test. And so he was saying that we should do them. And when you talk about why do the black kids sit in the cafeteria together, I'm gonna tell you, we got bust if more than three people was standing in a crowd and they were black, we were always told to break apart. That's when I learned that I couldn't be myself. I couldn't talk. I had friends that I went to school with. They would speak to me in school, but if they saw me in the mall with their parents, they act like they didn't know me. So that's what I'm saying. When you ask us what we need, the support that we need is that you understand that there is an issue, right? Even in the woman world, there is an issue. Now, how do we help that issue? We have to be willing in our positions to go where we would not go and seek out people who will be willing to partner with us, right? To give people opportunities that typically wouldn't have those opportunities. And you have to be able to be honest with self, I can't say that enough, to check your own biases and what you have been taught over the years. And I'm gonna tell you that, that's even for us. Black people are not exempt. And I think a lot of times we say that, but we're not. I'm gonna tell you, my dad grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, in the, with Martin Luther King. He grew up sitting on the back of the bus. He grew up where he had to cross the street because if he even brushed a white woman, not only would he could be jailed, he could be dead. So those are the difference. So I'm gonna tell you what my dad told me. Don't you ever trust a white person ever. You hear me? You cannot trust white people. Why did he tell me that? Because of his experiences, all right? Now, I had a great mom, a beautiful mother. And my mother said, do not tell them that. She said, you need to judge every person by their character. You have good people of every race and of every color. And that's the truth. We are a flawed people. And we need to understand that. We got to take people where they are. But if we want to diversify and we want to bring inclusive, inclusivity, we got to be willing to go places that you typically would not go. And I have to be willing to come on this panel, which typically I would not have done. <laughs> and we love you for doing it, Carla. Okay, and on that note, because that actually is a great lead in to what Kelly's gonna talk about, let's take a quick break, right? Everybody gets a bio break, about five minutes, get up, stretch, because we've all been sitting here for a really long time. Stretch, take a bio break, walk around, get some more coffee, come back in about five minutes, and Kelly is gonna go into responsible leadership in equity, diversity, and inclusion which is exactly where Carla was pointing us. And I don't know how you did that, but you did it perfectly. So that is what we will do, but take a five minute break and we will all be right back.
I do that every time. Well, it, and it all got chopped off yesterday. And so now it's all wet. Yeah. <laughs> so Kelly, I grew up in the suburbs of Montreal. Did you? Yeah. When I was I was born at Lakeshore General. I think I might have been born there too. <laughs> Point Claire area, yeah. Point Claire, yeah. Yeah, yeah my um, my family is was from, mostly from um, Saint Anne de Bellevue area. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't stay there long. Like I said, we moved up north when I was really young, and then yeah. we didn't end up going back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, I mean, up in the suburbs of Montreal, um, I went to a French school there. And the community was primarily English, but the school itself was filled with all of the immigrants who came to Quebec and wanted to send their kids to French school to learn French. Oh, yeah. um, so it was fantastic. It was a very multicultural environment. It was, it was great having everybody get used to that at such a young age. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Quebec's, uh, you know, Quebec was at that time, Montreal was a beautiful international city and yeah. Quebec government now is really messing up. I don't, I don't know yeah. what they're thinking. I'm, I'm ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I, they've gone downhill a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, just a bit. <laughs> but um, but you know, there's pockets of lovely things. But this this current, uh, yeah, that, and 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 because of these policies, interesting people and groups are leaving again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not quite yeah. the welcoming place that it uh, used to be. They wanted to be a, an artificial intelligence hub, and then they put in that other policy. It's like uh, they all left yeah. <laughs> to Toronto. <laughs> Your hair looks nice, Melissa. <laughs> okay, let me unmute myself. Uh, we are back. Uh, okay, so Kelly, after our break, is now going to, since Kelly does this for a living, um, and I love listening to her talk, is going to talk about responsible leadership uh, in EDI. So, Thanks so much. So when, when I started doing this work, I was working with a bunch of physicists, so I had to make sure everything I was doing was data driven. And then as I dove into the data, I realized we were doing it like we weren't following the data at all. So these communities that relied on uh, peer review and merit-based systems, we're not applying the data in any way consistently and, and we're sort of treating EDI as this practice, this thing that you do on, you know, on once a week, you say something nice or you put a poster up with several different colored hands holding the world together and, and that was your EDI work. And I was just wondering, like, where is that, you know, where is that disconnect? So yeah, I wanted to train my experience in training executives and boards and the reason I created the my practice to focus on them is because they have the most power for systemic change and so um i was really getting annoyed i this i usually introduce my like way i do these things with an engineering story in can in canada the women were leaving engineering the data said they were leaving because it was a toxic environment they weren't being respected they weren't being given the hard assignments they were given the easy assignments they were experiencing bias and more than any other career that where people have invested a lot in their education, they were leaving. And so they decided to train women to be better engineers for 30 years. So they totally ignore the data and put, you know, women in engineering, how to be a leader and how to be, uh, how to, you know, how to be more robust in the workplace and da, 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 not dealing with any of the actual issues. And so in 30 years of investment, we had still less women engineers than when we started. And I thought, okay, what's going on? And so that's, so that's really sort of the basis of how I got started in this. So I wanted to talk today uh, a little bit about responsible EDI and how collectively the majority of organizations have all the tools to do better, but have collective impacts of unconscious bias and systemic racism that makes them blind to their failure to overcome this challenge and, and enact meaningful change. You know, our boardrooms and executive teams remain ho largely homogenous. As my father used to say, when it comes to effective diversity inc and inclusion, we are collectively rearranging the chairs on the Titanic while it's sinking. That's sort of our EDI efforts are sort of like volunteer driven or a little committee here or and we're just rearranging some chairs, but the ship's going down. <clears throat> so I'll demonstrate with a few examples. There's an indisputable amount of data and evidence for the business case. Not that we should even need a business case for this, but let's just talk about the business case. 
that diverse, inclusive workplaces um, outshine. It, it is basically the recipe for organizational excellence, right? We've seen the studies, diversity on a board, better profits, diversity on a research team, better outcomes, diversity uh, on a, a team that does R&D, better invention. We might not have made the, you know, the airbag uh, so powerful that it would kill women and children had they had a diversity on that engineering team. So it's, and it's, it's 30 years old, right? So, um, so when we pause and we think about this, we wonder why are we, why are these evidence-based people ignoring this whole body of evidence? Indeed, the evidence is so compelling that you can't really think about having a high functioning team without making this central to your business decisions. Yet we consistently use criteria or one size fits all thinking that may, that, that many believe current standards for merit and excellence will be compromised if we bend the rules or change the system. So it, it, it makes no sense, right? The evidence is saying we have to be more inclusive and that we can't have equality unless we have equity, which means different criteria for different groups, but yet we do this one size fits all thinking. We still view this as sort of charitable work or, or something about a moral challenge that we have. Um, and we ignore that this is sort of central to, to uh, effective business decisions. Deloitte, Deloitte reports that most organizations don't fund equity activities, diversity or inclusion activities, at, and most organizations don't have this as a central preoccupation on the executive agenda. Um, McKinsey has research in this area for 40 years. I mean, we, we keep saying we respect these, um, these organizations like Deloitte and, and, and McKinsey, but in this particular area, we ignore their, their evidence. Indeed, even Deloitte has a, a, an article that says six, um, six signature um, traits of inclusive leadership. And in that article itself, I was talking about this, Melissa, the other day, they use culturally unsafe terminology. I mean, this is, this is how crazy this is. Um, and they're failing to respond to the changing talent pool, right? So when, you know, we do business analytics uh, as a reflex now, I mean, these are, these are very common uh, um, skill sets. So we know that engaging more women in full-time positions, engaging older workers would increase the GDP in Canada, and I suspect in many Western countries in significant ways, because we still have the same demographic shift. Um, collectively, we've failed to update our work policies and benefits to even accommodate parents. Um, caregivers or older workers are gonna need more time off, but we don't adjust for that. Um, we don't adjust for care at all in our apologies. You know, it's sort of a, a, a burden. Care has become a burden. Caring and taking care of each other is a challenge now, which is, you know, particularly in research, if you look at um, two students, one student is supported financially and doesn't have to worry about anything about his research. And you compare that to a student that has to have a part time job and potentially raising a child, who do you think is going to have better research outcomes, the way we've set it up now. We ignore the impacts of poverty on our participation in hiring uh, education institutes and we create merit systems designed for those with financial privilege and then we say we can't find diverse candidates. For example, the fastest growing demographic in Canada is Indigenous youth and their experiences in our education system, especially at colleges and universities, is an exposure to colonized systems and colonized content. We haven't indigenized our content or our learning uh, effectively in Canada. And, it's, and the systemic racism they experience, which we know after study after study after study has shown that they are experiencing this on campuses um, and we're not adapting. But we're sending out a lot of, a lot of comments from presidents that we, 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 are, we stand against systemic racism, but you're not seeing that real uh, meaty data-driven change in the middle. Technical engineering knowledge economy jobs are being filled by new Canadians who have been in Canada for less than five years yet their names on resumes are less likely to be picked over and over and over again. Study after study, provincial study, federal study, international study, we know this. If, you know, John Bell is gonna be picked over another name, period. Um, we know that unconscious bias prevents us from making sound people decisions that are heavily influenced by our experiences and the biases that we have no control over. Yet key performance indicators, metrics, targets are reserved for business decisions and not the same rigor is applied to people decisions. Why are we not applying the same rigor that we do in business analytics to our people who we say consistently is the talent and employees of our organization 
we care about them and support them so much. We don't collect data on their experiences, on their ability to feel empowered, their feelings of progression in the universe. Can I progress? Can I see myself progressing in this organization is a, one of the key measurements I do in my work. And that's where you see what identity they can feel comfortable showing at work and what identity they're hiding. And people are hiding, that burden is very different for different demographics. Some people uh, here have been told, I don't want your indigenous uh, identity in the workplace whatsoever. Can you leave that at home? These, this, this, is, this is a reality uh, with, that's happening live right now in Canada. Um, and this is that uh, ability to not control our unconscious bias is Nobel Prize winning research and science. When have we ever ignored a Nobel Prize winner? But we're ignoring this science right now. I did that engineering story already about, you know, we needed more engineers in Canada. And so male engineers just didn't have the capacity to say potentially the culture that we've created could be toxic for other groups. It must have been a weakness in the women because the stereotypes about women are around that right the way you know they're weak they can't they're not they're not aggressive enough and then and then if you are aggressive well then you're you're, you're sort of ping for that as well right it's that dance that we've we've all felt so many organizations don't po apply the power and promise of disaggregated intersectional data analytics to understand trends and movement of their own talent pool and staff um, this would easily reveal the bias and where efforts are required, right? When you really look at, um, if you see a team and there's a huge rotation out of that team, you can probably assume that it's not a friendly place to work. If you see consistently that you have diversity at the lower levels, and then as people move up through the organization, that diversity is lost, it's a pretty clear indication. You have to choice as a leader then. You can say, you really are superior to vast amounts of the population that you walk this earth with or there's systems that are preventing really great talent from moving up in your organization. So I wonder what people say when they sit on this board and it's homogenous and they look around, they must, they have to at some point have this, this sort of understanding that in one way they feel like they've been, they've earned their right to be there and they have, they've probably worked quite hard and it's not easy to rise up in the ranks. And, and as I'm a former executive, it's kind of a tough place to be and it's not very friendly. Um, but at the same time, you either are denying the evidence that there's systemic exclusion or you you believe that you are actually superior. I mean, there's just really no other choice at this point because the data is showing you that there are systemic uh, ways of, of keeping out these people from, from seeking employment in your organization. I'll give you an example. Indigenous Affairs here in Canada, the government department that is dealing with Indigenous Affairs, wants, has a, a metric that they want to hire more Indigenous people they require a university degree. They don't require somebody to have experience advocating for a community or on a band council or in local government or, or who have deep, deep uh, indigenous knowledge. They've just put that criteria. They'll never see some of the resumes of the top candidates that could actually help them with reconciliation because the system just doesn't allow those resumes to even enter the building. And so it's those types of one size fits all criteria, not really thinking about what do we want to achieve? What skill set does that look like? For example, in high performance computing, you know, the ability to work with new languages completely changed the way you're working to be really agile, to be open to, um, well, we did it this way yesterday, but this new thing happened and now we're doing it this way is a really core competency. And in some cases, they didn't need a PhD in physics to be great at HPC. And, and we have in, here in Canada, people that just were those people that just program all day in the basement, they were the superstars now, and they don't have any formal certification. So what do you want to hire? Not by having these set criteria, you're upholding a system that excludes talent and creativity. I myself work at a university. I've been ex an executive ex director of external affairs. I've been hired in the government and they gave me a pass. I don't have a university degree. I only have a, 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 a three-year college degree. But they saw something in my skill set and they wanted my skill set. But I look friendly, right? I look like them. And so they gave me a pass because they can bend the rules for some, but when they apply the rules to the people that are not part of the homogenous group, they're applied much more severely. And I think somebody said uh, they were told they had to be the best or else they would always be assumed to not have skill set. This is, this is prevalent. Now we know that Harvard Business Review believes that the future of leadership is a leader who doesn't have all the big ideas, but is someone who can create an environment where ideas and creativity of others are supported. And that's foundational to inclusive leadership. The ability to empower employees with a sense of belonging and the belief that they can 
they could be leaders in that organization. It's where you get the most talent and the most innovation. And the, the attributes we assign to strong leadership is not humility, the ability to listen, empathy, and again, those that think they know it all and, and ignore the evidence. But that's what Harvard Business Review, another uh, respected brand in this space, is saying the future of leadership is here. Instead, we are exhausting these oppressed demographics by asking them to prove and explain their lived experiences over and over again. And they have to prove the existence of systemic racism and oppression, their experience of gender bias and discrimination uh, are, you, are, are now their burden to educate the dominant group, to allow the dominant group to have an aha moment. Oh, I didn't know, aha, I saw the George Floyd video and I didn't know. And, but you're getting that moment off somebody else's lived trauma that their day hasn't changed, um, as, as was shared earlier. In global business, they're starting to understand this because they understand the changing markets, right? We're, we're seeing uh, a middle-class emerge internationally in major, major markets. So of course, they're obsessed with selling them products. So understanding the culture of the customers and how to market and influence them in the age of social media is, is, is something that they're putting a lot of resources behind. They have to understand these population trends and they have to understand where, where the international talent pools are gonna come from. And they all understand that it's not from the Western countries. The talent pool, that will, will be inter like the talent pool from India and China will dominate by 2030 and they're preparing to cater to them. So they're starting to have a deep understanding in this area and they're starting to do things like um, with their diverse talent stay interviews. What will make you happier here? How can we make you feel more comfortable? What can we do to change? Uh, how are you supported? Do we need to change your supervisor? What would make you feel more comfortable? Do you feel culturally safe? They're obsessed with this sort of thing because they see the trends. So the evidence is clear. If we don't make that really meaningful uh, change and really look at it from a systems approach, from a business analytics approach, we're not gonna have any change. So for example, in the physics community, it's 150 years away before they'll even have gender parity if they do nothing. 150 years, right? So we have to dig in. And if we don't, dig, if the leaders don't dig in, then we're probably gonna have a few panel sessions like this in the physics community and no real change, right? So. Um, where, where's the information? Where can they get this? It's available. It's free. There's bias interrupters in California is a, a research hub that's taken all this research and created toolkits for organizations, managers, and individuals for their personal responsibility and their organizational responsibility on how to do effective, measurable, uh, EDI. And I just put the link in the chat. And Deloitte Xen has that uh, six signature traits of inclusive leadership, and I encourage people to to read it for the for because it is a, an excellent article with a poorly chosen few expressions um, that they break this down in a schematic and they break it down and, and it's its description of leadership is opposite of what we see in movies and what we've maybe have experienced in the workplace. It's really redefining what inclusive leadership is. So it's not a mystery. The evidence is there. We've had it. It's been, and and then we we still conduct more studies that come out with with no difference. It's it, the systemic uh, systems are, are excluding certain groups. There's we to do responsible EDI. You need to really make this the the obsession of of leadership and really dig in. And you have to co-design and understand and measure the experience, the lived experiences of the people within your organization. Otherwise, uh, there's a researcher at McGill here, University here. They've coined the phrase we've institutionalized lack of care. It's, it's the norm. And so every time we want to do something normal, normal care and support, it's sort of viewed through this lens of, well, maybe we should have like a, a volunteer working committee for those folks because it, it, they just don't take it seriously, right? So now I train young women with technical backgrounds that are being courted by, you know, they, they graduate and everybody's after them, they wanna hire them. I train them to ask different questions of their employers and, and really empower them to ask. So you say, diversity inclusion is important. Show me, what metrics do you normally collect? Is that report transparently published to employees every year? How many cases of harassment have you had? What are the outcomes? These are these are facts that we, we treat sexual harassment as something before the Me Too movement as something we only talked about with other women, but we actually ex we live our lives trying to prevent it, not wanting to be in underground parking lots, not going out too late at night, all these things. Why is our safety at work our responsibility? So how, how do you set up events? How do you do, uh, if I go to a conference, how will I be protected as, as, as a new employee? Um, 
you know, how, how do you, what is your flexible policies for families? Um, if my mother gets sick, what will happen to my job if I needed to take time off for care? Why can't we ask these questions, especially if you're wearing that ticket, if you're, you're that talent pool that they want and they know they need to engage, I think we should start exercising that power. And I let the, the executives know that I train, that that's what I'm training the next generation to ask at their next interview. And I just, um, I know I sound a little bit, I've had a week in this space, so I've added, I sound a little bit more, <laughs> Uh, charged up. But, you know, I really just want to, it's not our responsibility to do all this work in a volunteer. I mean, I'm happy to be here today and volunteering and I, I'm loving meeting new people in this space. But the reality is, it's not a volunteer activity. We have the tools and the knowledge to make change. We, we've just, you know, put cameras on Mars and we're watching HD videos. Do you think we can't figure out how to have a more balanced boardroom and a more balanced employee space? And I, I think, you know, we often put this, leaders put this in, I want to do something, but I just don't know what, and I tried this and it didn't work. Well, we, we have the business analytics chops to get this right. We can assess this problem, figure it out and build in systems and, and measure and see and iterate. We've got agile software programming. If we can do agile programming, why can't we do agile EDI, right? So. Um, I, I just, I, I'm sort of, we're sort of gently asking leaders to pay attention to this and I'm saying we should be demanding it a little bit more and that's sort of the space I'm in now with, with, with what I'm doing uh, with, uh, with executives. So that's, that's, that's what I wanted to share today. Thank you. That's great. Um, do we have any questions? Actually, Teresa posted something that says the Deloitte head of diversity was fired this week for bullying. So same here in Canada, um, Mission Honor in the military was designed to eradicate um, uh, harassment in the military. Uh, General Vance was a highly respected chief of staff. Um, so now he's been disgraced because he had inappropriate um, relations. His replacement had to leave because four weeks into the job, he was found out. <laughs> Poor, uh, poor conduct, and then the you know replace like sort of junior replacement uh, to sort of the, take that file over while they figure this all out. Also had to leave because he was exposed, and so you know, yeah, we stop it, right? <laughs> like stop it. Cut know? that out. <laughs> I mean, when you, how do you have confidence when when these things keep happening? When we keep having these figureheads saying they're going to make systemic change, and then we, we don't have the results we need. And I, I think we're, we have a, I'm not sure if it's used there, but in Canada, the Indigenous community calls it translation exhaustion. I'm just tired of explaining my experiences yeah. for, for you. So then they, they shut down. And I notice in organizations that have done some good, people are willing to share their experiences. And if they, it's really toxic, nobody shares. It's sort of a, a measurement I, I notice. Yes, Victor, he was replaced, he was replaced, he was replaced. There's one variable that could be changed there. <laughs> I know they are courting a female candidate now, so we'll see. What Good. <laughs> yes, we have two new female generals in this country in the military because the generals who were going to promote them did not want to promote them during the pre previous administration because they knew they would not be um, elevated. So as soon as we had a new president, we had two new female generals. So yes, it's no gender is not a problem. No. So um, with that, I think that is all of the sort of prepared remarks we had. If any of the other panelists want to make any additional comments, otherwise we um, have plenty of time for Q and A. Um, we're here until twelve, so we have lots of time. Uh, if we end early, we end early. Um, but if you have questions, please post them in the chat or raise your hand, and we can actually allow you to speak if you'd like to do that. Uh, or panelists. Anything you wanted to add? I'll just add, I mean, we already kind of said it, but making sure exposure, uh, recognizing students, they don't know what they don't know. They're not gonna be interested in something that they've never seen, they've never been exposed to. Um, like they said earlier, being intentional. Uh, make sure that you have a person that's talking to the students that the students, I don't even say that they have to look like them, but just that they can relate to them. So if you have a person and they may be the smartest person in the world, but they have zero people skills, they're probably not the one that I would put in front of the student, just because that can make such a difference of that person speaking to the students versus you having the teacher tell them about it. Like you may have that person that has all that knowledge, talk to one of the teachers, 
and then let the teacher say it. And then they can, you know, be standing there like an assistant and say, oh, well, that means this. But just remember relationship is almost everything when you're working with students. And I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't express it enough of just how much the relationships matter, how much that exposure matters, how much being intentional, um, and that's intentional, like uh, Carla said earlier about where you're going to talk to the students, what students you're talking to. Um, like for us, if, if I'm looking to get more black and Hispanic students into things, I'm going into schools where the 50% or more are black and Hispanic. So it's just making sure that we're making those efforts. Um, I wrote, uh, talk a little bit about, we did for one of our summer camps, we took a bunch of the students to Dell and had Dell set up a panel of people to talk to them. Talk a little bit about that because that was an amazing experience. The guy who set it up at Dell cried because he was so emotional about how wonderful it was. It, it, so. was, it was honestly one of the best panels I had ever seen from industry. And we took students, that was 2016, I want to say. Was it that long ago? It's, it's been a minute. Wow, it's been a while. <laughs> a long minute. But yeah. yeah, we took the students to Dell. We actually had the conversations back and forth of, hey, these are the students that we're bringing. Um, he had said he wanted, you know, who's going to have a panel. And it was like, hey, just make sure that the panel will be diverse and be able to talk to students with different backgrounds because not all of the students, they were 10th and 11th graders, not all the students at the time knew if they were even interested in STEM. So just to give a little bit of history on the TAC programs, we're not a recruitment program, we're a peer outreach program, which means we have the pleasure of being able to talk to and invite to our programs anyone. So we're not trying to get our UT numbers up, we're trying to get the STEM numbers, if you will, up. And so, during this program, just talking to Dell. And again, we had many conversations before the students got there. It wasn't, hey, we're gonna be there at six. And then we just showed up. Uh, we talked and they said, okay, we'll have a panel. I'm like, that would be great. If you could have various different things with different backgrounds, they would really appreciate that. Again, I didn't know any of the people. And when we got there, I wanna say there was one or two women on the panel and there were uh, I want to say it was three men and it was all different races. The majority of our students, I, I want to say probably 70% of the students were, 60% of the students were Hispanic, 50% of the students were Hispanic, 35% were black, and then the rest were other. And the panel was Asian, black, white. It, it didn't matter. And honestly, it didn't matter because the stories they gave, like one, one guy started talking about how he only got into tech because he was gonna get suspended from school again. And his teacher told him that if he would go to the tech class, he wouldn't get suspended. So he knew he wouldn't get in trouble with his parents. And so he ended up staying with, I mean, it was like thinking about it. It was just great to see people say, and he was like, I'm 30 and I still don't know what I wanna do because a lot of students as well think that they have to have their whole lives figured out and they have to have this perfect plan already. And it, it was, it was like I said, it was one of the best panels and it wasn't orchestrated as far as say this, do that, be over here. It was just more of make sure you get people who have different lived experiences and they stood up there and they had a different experience. So I, I was pleased and the students are pleased and still some of the students. So one of the students from that program has tried to contact people at Dell, like came through me because they have to wait till they're at least 18 before they can contact them. And the student came 18 and said, hey, can I get their information now? So it, it was good. It was really good. And we went back the next year and it was good as well. And they, I still had students as well say, how can I get in touch with them? Uh, for future opportunities because they had talked about internships and just opening your eyes and exposing your eyes. But we got to go through the lab. Um, we got to see the technology, of course, see the office space. They loved eating in the cafeteria. I think <laughs> that was definitely the highlight. And they got to order whatever they wanted. And so many people got sushi and never had it. And it's, but it's a big deal for students who've never had certain things to try it. And it's great to be able to put them in a space. Like one of the things we talk about in the campus, try something new. Like if you tried, for instance, if we had sushi, we don't, 
but if we had sushi for one of the lunch periods, you tried it, you absolutely hated it. I will go and buy you something else to make sure that you're good. But this is their opportunity to explore. And something as small as food gives them an opportunity to say, you know what, I tried it and it was good. Or I tried it and it was awful. But, but I tried it. Right. But I took that step and I tried. One thing that concerned me th during this past year is what's happened with the interns. We have uh, a summer internship program and uh, all interns from different schools come to, to our campus in Austin or other sites, but I'm talking about the one in Austin. And we have some programs for them and some of them is having a picnic, right? And this is, this is that socialization that's, that's missing at this moment. It's, uh, um, how do they connect with each other? And then also how do they have the, I was invited to some lunches. So I would just speak to those, uh, to those interns in a very uh, relaxed environment. So it's not that I have this podium where I'm preaching, oh, I'm Christina, or oh, no, I'm a director, boo. No, this is at the table and um, do like this food and having this, this uh, breaking those barriers. And I think we did have some interns last year, but of course they had to be in their own homes. So we shipped them a laptop and it became more about them contributing something technical to the, to the team, that, that social interaction. And um, it's also an education, right? Because they, they get to see how we're learning, how we're living our life in our professional environment. And that also influences their decision, right? We have to say, oh, this is something that I can see myself doing for the next, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, or is it like, no way, I don't want to work with these people, right? So it, we have to court the, the, the young talent for them to, to be interested to come and work with us, and also to, to put our best foot forward, right, to, to show them that. And I think it makes a difference. I mean, right now, I think you have to be very creative. So you have to be creative on getting students involved and how do you do more than just work? So are you playing games? Are you guys having, I say lunches together where you're all just on camera? Are you like, are you sending stuff where they can make cookies together so you guys all cook together? Are, like it takes more effort, but it still can be done to still create that bond. And I saw someone unmute. So Maria, did you have a question? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, it, it's sort of a question and a comment. If, I'd like to follow up on when, what Kelly was talking about, and I think it's so important. In order to make companies, especially big companies, really enact true diversity and inclusion, accountability needs to be in place for, in place for those companies. Right now, some of us are just so tired of their cognitive dissonant message. When they say publicly, oh, we care about you know, black, black Lives Matter and all of that, they put out their fancy uh, public uh, press an announcements. When in, in the inside, they, are, they still lack accountability and they allow their managers to discriminate and harass, and not only sexual harassment, because as Kelly was saying, you know, now we talk more about that. Uh, it's it's a more open conversation of, uh, around that topic, but around race, I don't think we are we are talking enough about that, and especially not inside the companies. So when you see these public displays of support for for uh, diversity and inclusion, and then when you see it on the inside, managers are still allowed to uh, foster those behaviors. That is just not believable. Um, one very concrete thing that we all can do is to push for legislation to be passed to um, a, m forbid NDAs uh, that are forced upon um, employees to sign upon when they leave a company in order you know, to receive a, a a small severance that, that employees desperately need. If, if an employee is being pushed out, you are going to need that, that money. But the condition to take that is to sign an NDA that prohibits you from talking about the racial discrimination 
the racial harassment you suffered. It's just nonsense. And actually in California, that legislation, it's, it's a Congress representative that is pushing for that, that legislation to be passed because it has been shown that those NDAs that big tech companies uh, have in place foster illegal behavior inside the company. So it's one, one speech that they give out to the world, to the public relationship, you know, through their PR. And it's another thing what they are doing on the inside. And now there's legislation that is saying exactly that. These NDAs for starters are preventing the com an open conversation about racial discrimination and harassment. And it's fostering illegal behavior inside those companies. And another uh, very important thing that needs to be done, there's many companies that are great about recruiting, but they are terrible about retaining diverse people and you know they they show you their 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 very encouraging metrics they say oh you know we are achieving pay pay parity and all of these but they don't show you their attrition numbers so that let's say they push out maria you know who is a hispanic uh, engineer don't worry that won't show up on the numbers because we will replace her with another hispanic and guess what then our numbers will be wonderful. So accountability on the ranks of the company is very important, pushing and supporting legislation that, that, that prevents them, stop them from engaging in illegal behavior. Um, it's important and, uh, and really showing attrition numbers. I think it's, it's, it's really important. Yeah, this whole NDA and uh, signing that NDA business, I tell young women to really question their employers about that. I mean, you're seriously asking me to sign, <laughs> I've been harmed, and then you're asking me to be silent about it with the payout. The whole thing is to protect the logo and reputation of the organization. And I think that kind of behavior is what's really sort of helped uplift the cancel culture because they have no voice in their, uh, and so they have to find a way to express themselves. And uh, if we had better systems, we wouldn't have these these, you know, these awkward systems that are in place, if, if they had taken the trauma seriously in the first place, uh, and, and, and the well being of their employees in the first place, they might not be so willing to, you know, th throw something up on social media and, and just, you know, destroy a brand or whatever that way. They, I mean, this is this is meaningful conversations and meaningful understanding of people's internal experiences is, is, you know, imagine if we ran our families like that, you know, it was just, it's ridiculous. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, yeah. You just cannot talk about it. You're just preclu precluded by law. And 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 there's people who are saying no, that's illegal. Actually, you can talk about even so. It's illegal to have those NDAs and specify you cannot talk about uh, sexual harassment or uh, not sexual. Well, that could be, but gender gender discrimination. A company cannot prohibit you to not disclose the gender discrimination you were subjected to, but they can prohibit you from disclosing racial discrimination. So we just need to change the law. We just need to have law to tell these companies, no, you cannot do this. I'm hearing a lot from executives too. They'll say, you know, one, one group I said, you know, why not start with uh, anti, uh, an anti-Black racism training and campaign? And they said, well, what about other groups? Will they feel excluded? Or if you say anti-Indigenous racism training, they'll say, well, what one person said, um, what about other equity seeking groups? And it's like, if you if you start with people that have, you know, are experiencing, you know, significant levels of, of oppression and you start removing those, we all win. So it, there's no problem with starting this. And I, I've had I've had black employees come to me and say, I've tried to implement this at work and they told me I was being self-serving. I mean, it's it's really, uh, you know, the disconnect at, at sometimes at, uh, with a person that has never entered a room and felt uncomfortable uh, potentially or has and and um, has put up some uh, defenses because of that and it's not it's sort of shut down those feelings it's it's pretty i'm hearing this over and over again about well we you know we want to be inclusive to all but by, by saying that you're really just serving the dominant culture again yeah kelly can i ask you a question um i wanted to know like i was listening to you um the data is it um, 
Um, just like Maria said with the accountability, do you see more companies uh, because of the Black Lives Movement and because of what happened this past year, um, maybe lean more towards like more of let's just fill these spots? Meaning like, hey, let's just hire these Black people, even though they might not be qualified, but now I have the numbers to say that I'm being inclusive. And then that's probably one of the reasons for the turnaround and the retention. Is that one of the things that we're saying as well? I've seen it a lot. Like in Canada before Black Lives Matter, Trudeau wanted to have a feminist government, right? And so he was putting, um, if you wanted to sell to government, you had to, dem you know, don't show up with an all male executive, right? And, and he was starting to put these pressures in. The backlash, <laughs> the international backlash and misogyny that he received over that was, but I mean, some progress, right? He did. Um, it's very strange in Canada now, we, the government has gone and done, uh, not strange, but given our our history and our, our first peoples and the experiences of them they, there's a large large uh federal wide campaign for anti-black racism and nothing for anti-indigenous racism which doesn't make any sense if, if you if you understand the canadian context but um it's the companies that have global presence that have seen the trends that are doing it well and sort of demonstrating best practice like i've seen some really good stuff at accenture and some really good stuff at some international companies because they know their market's not going to be markets they understand and so th there's some really i would say two things are going on there's some interesting trends when it's related if it means if it's really it's sort of sad to say but if it's related to profits and the future competitiveness mm -hmm. that's where the innovation is happening in institutions that are slower to adapt government education places like that i'm seeing um like the government saying one thing, and so the prime minister, leader of the country, saying we want to, you know, have appropriate reconciliation, and the minister, the, the the civil servants aren't delivering in the in the way that the words of the prime minister would suggest that they should be moving towards. So there's a real pushback. The, there's deep, deep indigenous um, uh, exclusion and racism in Canada, probably the the, the worst demographic in that sense. Um, because it's viewed uh, the complexity of, of uh, reparations uh, uh, and and the need to give back um, land and resources uh, appropriately and it, it, was, it was legally but it, it, it's it, these, these are coming Trudeau was pushing that forward as he's pushing the reparations forward there's a there's the opposite effect right it's sometimes I think increasing um, uh, acts of racism against these 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 groups and so uh, we can't the, the institution can only, transform as fast as we all transform right, right. The, right. the public opinion and so um yeah it's a complex time i think it's it's it, it can be um but i'm not i'm not seeing like and i'm not i don't i'm not i'm not like a, i'm a one person show so i'm not seeing everything right but i i just i don't i don't see like i see pockets of magic happening like they're like up north they have this whole research uh, uh co-design community-led research that community-led research movement is really making differences in community where they're taking the challenges within the community and designing with them and working with them and and lots of participation and and, and willingness to change but um so like within the systems there's these pockets of, of excellence but i don't find i don't see them sort of um being as global as they should be at the, by this time uh, that's just i don't know if that's been your experience Yeah, I'm in education, so I always tell people the two biggest segregated places you can ever go is education and church. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't care what anybody yeah. say. Like they, they say that we're integrated. Everybody knows that we're not. I'm, I'm, I'm in a school right now where 84% Hispanic. You know what I mean? If we go down the road, I can go to Westlake, and because of the neighborhood, then they're 90 something percent white. You know what I mean? So, um. And like you said, it's education. They try to make us inclusive, right? And, and I am in this school, like we said, over 80% is Hispanic. And then, but if you look at the staff, you know, 60% are white, you know? So, and then we say, we say things, um, well, people of color are not going into education anymore. Like it, it's just the, the things that you hear. And then they say, well, we couldn't find anybody. And I'm like, really? Cause we have all these vacancies. I'm just trying to figure it out. And, you know, it, it, it's that constant, you know, the conversation, like you said, and you see it in, in solo pockets, right? It's like you have these little, I call them the solo heroes, 
And we actually know what can be done and what needs to be done. But if we all go to that particular place and use their techniques and use what they're doing, that means we're all held accountable. And then that means the things that I'm thinking personally and by myself and some of the the conversations I have behind closed doors, they might be now what revealed to other people. And so just like you said, like I, I just feel like it's a huge issue, but I do believe in that change happens one person at a time. And as one person puts, you know, infiltrates, then it, it'll move forward to what we want it to be. I can't, like I always tell people, I can't change the whole world, but the one person that I can change and impact is myself. But I, I do see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We have other questions from the group, other comments that our panelists want to make. No questions. Wow, quiet. It got quiet. Well, um, let me just throw up my last slide. Um, so Oops, come on, there we go. So I wanna say thank you to all of my wonderful panelists. I love you all, this was awesome. Um, I wish we could just keep chatting forever because we probably could. Um, but here is the uh, Texas Women in HPC. Uh, oh, I didn't even put up our website, but it's if you Google Texas Women in HPC, um, we, are, we have a, a little website. Um, we have a Twitter account and Facebook. Um, if you're interested in uh, any of the things you heard today, uh, please send me an email. I'm happy to connect you to any of our panelists um, or you can Google them. I'm sure you can find them. Um, if you uh, have a company and you're interested in participating in one of our summer camps with Code Attack with what Don does, uh, please contact me. We would love to have um, more companies involved in, in getting involved with these uh, high school students who, and showing them what STEM is all about uh, and HPC uh, and oil and gas even. So please let me know. But thank you so much uh, for coming, for participating. Um, thank you to uh, the, all of our attendees uh, and for putting your comments in the chat and questions. Uh, we had a really good time. We had a great conversation. Uh, and again, this uh, conversation was recorded and will be uh, posted with the Rice Oil and Gas Conference website uh, after today. So, And thank you to Michelle uh, and uh, Meredith and uh, for helping us organize all of this. This is awesome. So thanks. Thanks, thanks everyone. It was great meeting everyone.